There's been reports of an explosion outside Liverpool Street Station. A huge explosion uh, on the street up in front of me, and all I could see was the top of a bus completely destroyed. I just thought, well, I thought I was dead. I heard a very loud bang, the lights went out and the carriage filled with smoke. There is just row after row of ambulances turning up all the time. We will not allow violence to change our societies or our values. Something like 45 people so far have died, uh, and the number of injured is uh, approaching 1,000, uh, and of that 1,000, 150 of those are said to be seriously injured. I spoke to a police officer just a little while ago, and he said there were a number of seriously injured people. He used the word busloads. Gary, thanks for coming on the show and joining us today. Um, many of us can remember that day on the 7th of July when four bombs hit London. Um, it's forever printed in our history. But you have a very unique experience of that day. C can you tell me about what that day was for you personally? Yeah, I was actually uh, I was on paternity leave at the time. I was part of our new newly formed sort of counter-terrorism team um, with the British Transport Police. Um, my wife phoned me and said, oh, have you heard what's happened on the, on the rail network, on the underground? And mm. She said there'd been a power surge and I sort of cut her off and said, look, I'll phone you back in a minute. Um, and I phoned one of my mates up. I could hear the blues and twos going. He said, look, we've just been bombed. Get your grab kit and get in. And he went, I'll oh, stand by. We've just been bombed again. Um, and there was no chance I was going to get in. The network was closing down. The phones were going down. And I just felt at that time a little bit helpless because realistically, I should have been at, at work. And you on paternity leave? Yeah, my wife had just had um, our third son. When I did get back into work, um, it was chaos in central London, as you know. Um, and one of my bosses just came up and said to me, oh, we need to get you down to the temporary mortuary. He said, because people are falling over, it's just horrific. And I was sort of like, well, why me? He said, oh, you're an ex-squaddy, you'll be all right. We obviously had to deal with the 52 victims, um, countless body parts, um, and what was left of the bombers. Um, and it, it, was, um, it was an unpleasant task. We was actually um, receiving the deceased at the temporary mortuary. Mm. Um, so as they could um, be processed and hopefully identified and then repatriated back to their families. Mm. So there are other teams, parts of our search team, which I was part of, um, they were down um, retrieving the deceased and all the body parts and they were then coming to us to be processed. And we would have to work on them to um, identify them basically. And that uh, must have been presumably it was very unpleasant. I mean, and, and very difficult because yeah. people were... Well, you just said that you had body parts and... Yeah, I mean, some people have been, unfortunately, down on the, the sites for a number of days. And if you remember, it was extremely oh, hot. So I remember. Decomposition was quite rapid um, on top of the blast injuries. Um, it, it wasn't the best environment to work in. And having dealt with, dare I say, Unfortunately, plenty of fatalities leading up to that via suicide on the railway. This was a whole new thing, but yeah, it was uh, it was unpleasant. But there was one, there was a case that knocked you sideways, though, wasn't it? Can you yeah. tell me about that? Um, so when we started to be able to formally identify the victims, mm. we were able to set up a, a temporary a temporary place of rest where families uh, could come and view their loved ones. We'd let the families pay their respects and then I would go back in <clears throat> um, and sort of place the flowers and, and bereavement cards and stuff into the body bags and take them back. But uh, on this specific day, um, one of the mortuary assistants just out of the blue called me Sarge and everyone was on first name or nickname terms. It was, you know, there was no rank structure mm. there at all. And she's just said, oh, this is really unpleasant. I was like, well, they've all been unpleasant. And allegedly, um, the gentleman that was coming to view, this young chap, he had just recently lost his wife, um, and that was apparently his only child. Um, so when it came to do the, dare we say, put the flowers and the cards in the, in the body bag, um, 
bearing in mind I've just got a new baby mm. boy. You okay? <clears throat> I caught sight of what was uh, written on this card and it just uh, just blew me away. Um, the feeling of guilt I had for this poor um, chap. Um, and I was going home to my new babies, or my new baby, my other two little boys. And it just, it's been ingrained in my, in my head for that day since now. I just haven't been able to um, get rid of it. Do you need to do you want to take No, it's fine. Are you OK? Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry, that's... It was just part of the job. But you had a, but you had, I guess the thing, you, what you're saying is it hit you in the sense mm. that it became a, a father and a son. Yeah. You were obviously traumatised, but I can mm. see it still, it still hits you even... Even now. Even now, that the kind of what was written on the card and yeah. that, that parent. Um, and then afterwards, could you tell us a bit about kind of what happened to you afterwards? Like you started drinking, yeah. you, you were um, su suffering with anger. Yeah, you know, the last thing I wanted to do is do what I've just done, shed a tear and show to my colleagues that I was weak. And, and in my head, I didn't want people to think any different. I dealt with it um, by drinking. Um, and I used to drink to stop the nightmares and the flashbacks. And it just become a revolving wheel. It came to a head in 2012, didn't it? You came home from a shift at the Olympics. Yeah. You went to your shots with one of your boys. Yeah. Th then what happened, Gary? So basically, uh, an incident started developing, and I, I was left in a situation where I had to call the job in. Um, I had my boy with me. Um, he was a, um, so he would have been nearly, nearly 12. Right. Yeah. And it was a difficult situation, and. This matter developed really quickly. Um, I called the police, um, and before I knew it, I was sort of fighting with this individual down on a local um, train station. So they tried to flee the scene. Yeah, you chased um, them. A, a uniformed officers turned up, um, and they ran away into the station. He was trying to get across the tracks, um, and in between that time, he was trying to be restrained by the two uniform officers. Um, we'd gone past the trespass gate mm. and it was just going the wrong way. And for a moment, it looked like he was trying to push the two young cops onto the live track and end up having to cross the trespass point, try to grapple with a fella, he tried to bite me. Um, I punched him to subdue him, to get handcuffs on him. Um, we managed to get that done, but all I could see in my head was that young fella in the mortuary. I was so fearful for not only what was going to happen to me, but to the two cops and the, the guy ended up being a complainant. And it, it, it calmed down a point, um, and it took five uniform officers to get this indiv individual locked up and escorted out of right. the station. And then, you know, I then had to give a statement and nothing really else happened. Um, but a few months later, I was informed that a professional standards department wanted to talk to me about an incident and then the matter just progressed. Right. And I was summoned um, to Magistrate's Court for an ABH offence. Right. And what, because the... The guy put a complaint in. Yeah, he'd complained. Yeah. And in 2013, we went to, to Crown. Um, and basically, the, the job went against me, um, even though the Crown Court judge had guided the jury twice to yeah. a not guilty verdict. Um, and if it wasn't for the judge, uh, I would have gone to prison. Right. Um, he wanted pre-sentencing reports okay. because he wanted to know why I'd acted so out of character. So you explained what had... Absolutely. And then he was lenient on you. Yeah. But you lost your badge. Yep. Yeah. I had to resign. I had to resign. Um, and then things just sort of went really downhill quite was quickly. Was that just absolute... How did you feel? Did you feel ashamed? Did you oh, just... goodness me. I... The descriptive is just never ending. I was ashamed. I felt so full of remorse for my family. I'd let everyone down. Um, I just felt awful. I honestly believed I was going to prison. You know, thankfully that never happened. Yeah. But again, I think that was a 
they would say the last screw in the lid for me. I just, I came back from court and the following day, I just got in my car and I went to a place where I used to deal with a lot of fatalities um, and I was going to do the same. So what, you you nearly took your own life? Yeah, I just sort of sat on the embankment knowing that, that I was on the right bit of the track for the fast trains um, and I could see the train coming um, and I just, I don't know, for a, it's a really thing, weird thing to say and explain, but I just felt so calm and I felt really quite happy. I hadn't felt that happy for a long time. At peace? Yeah, just knowing that I was about to stop being an embarrassment to everyone, having let everyone down. Um, um, and the misery I'd caused my family as a result of my behaviour. Um, I was never violent to them, I was just always so angry. Mm -hmm. And the train was nearly upon me and I just sort of stood up and all I had to do was take half a pace forward and that would have been that. Um, but thankfully, I fell back down again um, and the train went past. Had a bit of a cry, um, got back in the car, went home. Told your wife? Told the wife. Um, and it was just sort of like, you know, you have that moment where you just think, wow, that could have been, you know. That is a that is a hard story and that is a hard story to tell, so thank you for it's for, just um it's, sharing it. It's not something that I ever thought I would ever say to anyone, honestly, because it's, it's just quite, not me. It's, it's a very brave thing um, that happened and that was the beginning. The, the the low point was the beginning of your recovery. You went and sought help for post traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I had some treatment um and sort of started getting myself back together. But lots of other things were sort of coming into me, my mind at the time then. It was reflective in, in the sense that, well, I never received any help mm. at all. But I never asked for any help. So it's a bit of a dual thing. And you actually turned this awful situation for yourself into something that's very positive for you and other people because you've set up an organisation that helps that aims to support emergency workers that might not be getting the support and the support yeah. you, you say you need, you needed, well, you not say you clearly needed. Myself and the other co-founder, he's a, a former soldier as well. Um, we just got our heads together um, and thought, well, you know what, let's get something moving. And we started off as really as a, a social media, mm. but that just grew legs so quickly because the amount of officers up and down the country, not just central to, to London, mm who saw our little social media bits and pieces and were, were telling us almost similar stories to my own and, and a lot worse. Um, and it just got to the point where we thought, well, we're going to have to get these people help because they clearly didn't have trust in the organisations they were working for. And we was like, well, we get some clinicians who are trauma-focused therapists and somehow we will find some funding um, to help pay because it's not cheap, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. to get these people back on, on their feet to a point. But, I mean, the last few years have been really hard on emergency workers, haven't they? It's been shocking. You think back, we had the Grenfell fire, yeah. the London Bridge uh, yeah, events, just, yeah. and it just snowballed. Pandemic. The pandemic, the Croydon thing, mm. the tram. But the pandemic, again, it's... Again, people tend to disassociate that... The person who's dealing with that trauma is a human being. Mm. You know, they just look at the uniform mm. and it's the anticipation that it's that thing. That, well, that's their job, that's what they do. Mm. But, you know, when these guys get home and the girls and they take off their uniform, irrespective of what part of the services they're in, mm. they're human beings, they've got feelings and they've been dealing with the most awful stuff. Your message to government then would be that there needs to be more mental health support Absolutely. for frontline workers. Absolutely, and it needs to be done uh, at an early stage. Let's, mm. let's get this awareness um, training into recruits. Let's make it an annual event. You know, you have refresher first aid courses, you have officer safety training courses each year. Let's make this part now, uh, mm. the awareness programme that we've got, it highlights to the individuals to look out for the signs and symptoms not necessarily in the cells, but it might be in a colleague, might be in a family member. Thank you for coming to talk and tell your story, and I'm sure people watching this, it actually will help them 
and also your organisation is helping people Thank as well. You. So, thanks. I know it's not easy uh, to talk about what you went through, but I'm sure it will help people watching. So Thank thanks you very for much. your time. Appreciate Thank you. it. Cheers. Thank you.